Uh, this is now, we move to the Iron Age finally, and uh, we come to the Ganges uh, Plains, where you see if you open your, text, your, your, your children's textbooks, you will be told that the Iron Age is first millennium BC. Well, broadly speaking, it's okay in the sense of very widespread use of iron, but actually the technology develops much before. And the recent excavations in those sites, especially Malhar here, 1800 BC, uh, uh, several dates, this is by Dr. Rakesh Tiwari, but Dr. Vivat Tripathi of BHU has also done similar work and got similar dates. So we know now that iron technology in India, which was in olden days supposed to be an import, uh, in fact, of the Aryans. The Aryans were the ones who were supposed to have brought iron into India, and they were supposed to have used it to clear the, the iron tools to clear the virgin forests of uh, the Ganges civilization. Now those kind of scenarios have been totally negated because first of all the technology existed before, before their supposed arrival. Number two, we also know from studies again by Rakesh Shivari and others that Dr. Rakesh Shivari incidentally is at present Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India and we know that uh, there was no virgin forest ever in the Ganges plains. There were large pockets of forest no doubt but there were also lots of open grasslands. It was a kind of a savanna kind of a environment, not a virgin forest. So anyway, there was no virgin forest to clear. Uh, this is one uh, uh, furnace at Malhar, and you can see what is known as a tuyer, uh, another French word which means an opening through which you can insert a pipe. This is required to increase the temperature because, I see, a copper bronze will melt around 700, 800 degrees. But for iron, you need to reach at least uh, 1100. So you have to boost the temperature uh, by artificial means. You can't just have an enclosed uh, fire of charcoal. It will not give you the sufficient temperature. So insertion of pipes uh, uh, to, through which air will be blown initially, probably by mouth with a long pipe. Later on, we'll see systems of bellows, which will be much more pra uh, uh, practicable. These are some of the tools, needles, arrowheads, and so on. And this is an interesting uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, cutting tool, some, some, uh, some cutting tool, some uh, kind of it. So this is a little later in megalithic Maharashtra, about 1000 BC, you have a typical model of a, uh, a furnace, which is not very far from what we saw earlier. And you can see the tree air in particular, which I mentioned. Uh, so you will be, you will be <coughs> keeping the, uh, the ore here, surrounding with charcoal, and keeping a path for, it to, for the metal to flow out. And you get the slag at the end. Uh, so, uh, so this is how it works very briefly. Uh, we have a lot of interesting texts. But maybe I, I won't read this, otherwise I'll be running out of time. Let me just mention that uh, Arthashastra, for example, has a whole chapter on the superintendent of mines and how uh, uh, this uh, superintendent is supposed to be aided by experts in mineralogy and uh, uh, be able to examine mines and determine whether they were once upon a time exploited or uh, whether <coughs> Uh, they, uh, 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 they will be located on plains and mountain slopes possessing mineral ores, the richness of which can be ascertained by weight, depth of color, piercing smell and taste. Now this last bit is very interesting because I, I'll come back to it in a moment. Uh, but remember the, this uh, smell and taste of the ore, this is very interesting. So by that, of course, by that time, of course, the metallurgy is very developed. I think I've already explained that the first point, uh, but the, the, of course India is very rich in iron ore, especially the Vindhyas and the Deccan Plateau, so there's no shortage whatsoever. Uh, in fact, iron was sometimes used to create works of art. This is a very rare, it's in Lucknow Museum, I'm told, very rare, beautiful statue of Buddha, which must be more or less life-size. And I, I borrow this uh, uh, slide from the late uh, Professor Bala Subramaniam of Kampur, and uh, uh, it was gilded. It was covered with gold, as you can see. This is the relic. So, of course, it would have looked magnificent, but the whole of it was actually iron. 
India was known to be exporting iron and woods. I will explain in a minute what woods is. It's a special kind of Indian steel. All the way to the 1960s and possibly a little beyond uh, 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 from the Coromandel coast to Persia. So it's, uh, it's actually very intensive to the 18th century. It's the colonial era that will finally, as I explained in an earlier lecture here, that will finally put an end to the native Indian industry. So what is the, the in Indian uh, iron and steel industry? So what is this woods? Woods is a British corruption of a Canada word, which is ukku. And ukku is steel. And in fact, uh, you know that steel is nothing but carb carb carburized iron, iron with some carbon content. And uh, in South India, from at least 500 BC, so two, more than 2,000 years, these techniques were developed where in crucibles, they would put iron, first of all, iron would be extracted, and then chips of iron would be placed in crucible with some organic material, like wood, pieces of wood, uh, pieces of charcoal, anything that can provide carbon. And then this would be reheated for a, a long time and at a fairly high temperature, fairly high temperature. And finally, with some ore, some special ore, and the tradition is that the, these local people, these communities, they were either tribal communities or you know, deeply rural communities, uh, they, they knew how to identify the proper ore th through the smell and taste, which is very interesting because that's exactly what Cotillia used to say. There is, in uh, fact, uh, the, this uh, woods had special properties that you could hammer it into very thin blades, and it wouldn't break. Whereas ordinary steel, ordinary steel uh, actually will snap if you try to keep it very thin. So it had very special properties in that sense, and uh, it allowed the manufacture of sharp and thin swords, which were very highly valued in the Mediterranean world, uh, by warring people, you know, like you have here. Uh, this is based on a text uh, by a Roman historian who uh, narrates how Alexander the Great, after defeating Porus, took a tribute from Porus, which did not cons consist purely in gold and jewels, but in two and a half tons of Indian steel, because that was what was most valuable, that they could not get there. Indian steel used to be exported to uh, Damascus, and where it was shaped, it was there that it was shaped into swords. So it is also known as Damascus steel. And when the British came to India, they very much tried to understand how the steel was so much superior to the steel that they were making then in, in Britain and elsewhere in Europe. And they, for a long time, they could not. And uh, you have metallurgists from, uh, from England, from France and Italy, and uh, finally, it's only in the 20th century that one French metallurgist will be able to replicate wood steel. Because there are special techniques of carburization, special, you have to control the temperature in special ways. And now we have books and papers on all this and we can understand, but uh, uh, it took a long time. But what people don't realize is that all this research actually uh, boosted the uh, European research into steel and uh, helped improve the quality of uh, European steel making. So, so this is one case where, you know, um, uh, Indian technologies had an uh, indirect influence on European industry. You have here examples of weapons, but this is during medieval times, where, where, where woods were still produced in India. You have example of uh, weapons, uh, uh, made uh, and, and not only weapons, you could use that steel for uh, body armor, for example, because you could make it so thin, it was very light. Uh, previously, body armors, swords were very heavy things uh, and, and uh, it would be very cumbersome in battle. So the first British expert who studied Indian steel found it, uh, in quote, better than the steel produced anywhere else in the world. And uh, in fact, these were parts of the living, the, of the ancient Indian traditions um, uh, of uh, metal working, and there are uh, uh, communities which, in fact, there's a Sandhi, one of the Sandhi project 
is around uh, studying the agarias of uh, UP, uh, which still today uh, extract their iron when, when government has not interfered by deciding that they don't have a right uh, to do what they have done for 2,000, 3,000 years. You know, suddenly government comes in and said, uh, you know, we have a law that this, is, this can be done only by industries and so on. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is what these communities have been doing in uh, uh, UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, uh, Chhattisgarh, Bengal, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and in fact, perhaps probably all over India. Uh, except deep in the alluvial plains in the central, uh, in the middle of Sindh, of course, there would be no scope because you won't get metan ore. So they are, they, they are the communities that have really boosted the, and here you see some, uh, one of these metal workers from, <coughs> from uh, Tamil Nadu. And um, uh, in fact, as late as the 1960s, iron made by such communities was comparable to that of the Delhi iron pillar, which I am coming to in a, in a moment. This is another Bala Subramanian, not, not the IIT, um, uh, the late uh, Bala Subramanian of IIT um, Kampo. This is a demonstration which took place in IIT Madras in the 1990s, where actually one such community was invited to the campus to demonstrate their art of iron making. So here they are collecting the ore, and here they are setting up the furnace, and uh, uh, start, they start heating. And you can see here the functioning of the bellows, which are uh, prop pushing uh, air into the, the furnace and the heat the temperature. And you see at the end, this is how uh, in those crucibles, the, the uh, ore has been, I mean, the, 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 the metal has been smelted out of the ore and the end product. And those communities actually thrived by manufacturing all these metal tools, iron especially, or wood sometimes, and actually bartering them with other communities elsewhere. So they, would, they wouldn't have to practice agriculture. You know, if uh, uh, they had this production, they would exchange that against grain, against uh, whatever they, else they needed. And this is how Indian economy has functioned for centuries. Now, with this daily iron pillar, and here you have uh, uh, Bala, the late uh, Bala Subramaniam, uh, in front of it, because he's the one who finally cracked the mystery of why this uh, pillar, I mean, I, I think I should not tell this story here because I'm sure all of you know, but maybe a few fresh students might not have uh, read about it. Um, this pillar has been standing there for 1600 years, so how come it is iron, it is not steel, how come it has not rusted? And uh, many metallurgists, again, from 19th century started work on it, and they took chips, and they, they, they tried to understand uh, because, you know, there are many impurities in, in the iron. So which one was, so it was assumed that uh, uh, maybe chromium was responsible, uh, maybe this or that impurity. And it's actually Bala who, dis who demonstrated that it was phosphorus. And a special compound forms between phosphorus, iron, and oxygen of the air, which creates an invisible thin film over the surface of the iron. And that film protect it, protects it from... Uh, any dampness, any intrusion of dampness. And if you scratch it, that part will rust, but behind the rust, this film will rebuild itself in a few weeks, and then the, the rust will fall off and you will have a fresh, uh, brand new kind of um, uh, iron pillar again. So it is to the credit that uh, Bala could do this work, and uh, of course, it is well known that there were other uh, many other structures of rustless or rust-resistant iron in parts of India. This is the Dhar pillar, but it's broken uh, in Madhya Pradesh. These are the, uh, pil the uh, beams which were used in the Jagannath uh, temple in Orissa. Uh, this is a, a sketch by British. You can see those beams at the top. They are beams of rustless iron because uh, the, the structure is very heavy, using massive stone to build uh, such a, a temple. And, and to support the weight, they needed reinforcements. And then uh, these, they could not use ordinary iron, because unless our PWD, they could see that uh, the iron is going to rust, and then the whole structure one day will fall. So therefore, they needed rustless iron. 
and uh, to, to solve the problem. And this is confirmed at various other sites, such as here, Konark, the famous uh, sun temple of Konark, outside of which today you can see those rustless iron beams, which were once upon a time part of the superstructure of, of the temple. Even canons, and in fact, uh, Professor Bala Subramaniam wrote a beautiful book called The Saga of Indian Canons. Uh, in, even canons uh, were sometimes made of rustless iron, like this one in Tanjavu. So this was part of the research he was doing before he uh, uh, left this world prematurely, where he was actually doing some projects for the Indian railways to actually recreate the older type of rust-resistant iron because corrosion is a major uh, problem with the Indian railways uh, for obvious reasons. And he was able to show that uh, the, the adding some phosphorus was, was actually to the composition of the iron was delaying corrosion many, many times. But unfortunately, after he passed away, I don't think anybody has taken up this kind of research. But this is very interesting because it shows us how sometimes ancient technologies can still give us ideas. So of course we would adapt them, we would not uh, have to, and anyway those communities are gone, uh, those that were, that were doing really this, the restless iron are gone, uh, but uh, sometimes we may still pick out some ideas of ancient times and adapt them to modern problems.